These families were typically immigrants, and this was the other factor which helped transform the factory system. A major source of this immigration came from Ireland. In the 1840s, a catastrophic food shortage caused by the spread of the potato blight sparked a prolonged exodus. These poor immigrants typically lacked the resources to take, take up land in the West. Instead, they settled in the eastern cities and became an increasingly important source of labor for factories. Economic modernization was also encouraged, to an extent, by government. During this era, we see a number of states which finance transportation projects in hopes of improving their economy and developing commerce. At the federal level, intervention was more hesitant and controversial. Alexander Hamilton had proposed an aggressive program of government intervention in the economy, but the Jeffersonian Republicans had abhorred manufacturing and generally wanted limited government intervention in the economy. Following the War of 1812, however, we see the rise of the Neo-Federalist movement. James Madison, who became president after the war, set forth a plan which called for the recharter of the Bank of the United States and a protective tariff for American manufacturers. Both measures were approved by Congress. In 1816, we see the creation of the Second Bank of the United States, which helped stabilize the nation's currency and banking system, making commerce much easier. That same year, the U.S. enacted its first protective tariff. New England textile manufacturers and Pennsylvania iron smelters have been protesting the British dumping of manufactured goods on the American market after the War of 1812. The Tariff of 1816 was a response to their demands for protection. It raised import duties 20% on selected goods, with the intent of making imported goods more expensive and domestic goods more competitive. While producers of manufactured goods lauded this government aid, others were not quite so happy. Many New England shippers protested because they feared it would depress international shipping, while many Southerners argued that these import taxes hurt consumers and this measure unfairly favored the industrializing North over the still heavily agrarian South. How did the market revolution and the beginning of industrialization affect the lives of ordinary Americans? One key change was simply where Americans lived. In 1800, about 6% of all Americans lived in cities. By 1860, this had grown to about 20%. Most of the major cities were the same as in the colonial period. Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and New York. The biggest change was the growing power of New York because of its unique access to the commerce of the interior through the Erie Canal. At the same time, certain key western cities began to grow. Chicago, located strategically on the Great Lakes, became an important transportation hub, while St. Louis and New Orleans grew because of the booming trade on the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. New types of wage-paying employment also became increasingly available. These were not only jobs in factories, but also in transportation and other commerce-related occupations. As the market revolution developed, there was a growing demand for people to man and maintain the wagons, canal barges, steamboats, and trains which moved goods and people throughout the country. Consider that as more manufactured items became available, it created opportunities for eager entrepreneurs to set up stores to sell these goods, and they in turn hired staff to work their stores. Many Americans saw these jobs as stepping stones to the eventual economic independence that they craved. Abraham Lincoln set forth this vision in a speech in 1859. Quote, the prudent, penniless beginner in the world labors for wages a while, saves a surplus with which to buy tools or land for himself, then labors on his own account and another while, and at length hires another new beginner to help him. This, say its advocates, is free labor, the just and generous and prosperous system which opens the way for all. If any continue through life in the condition of the hired laborer, it is not the fault of the system, but because of either a dependent nature which prefers it, or improvidence, folly, or singular misfortune. The growth of the commercial and industrial society also provided benefits to Americans as consumers. 
Mass production dramatically reduced the costs of goods, such as clothes, shoes, household implements, farm equipment, tools, clocks and watches, newspapers, books, and a host of other items that increasingly became available to ordinary people. Yet, for some Americans, these economic changes had a troubling aspect. In the past, the manufacture of goods was in the hands of independent craft workers. They would start off as young apprentices, who would be taught the skills of their trade in the shop of a master craftsman. Then they would become journeymen, free to find employment wherever they wanted, but still in a shop owned by someone else. Finally, having accumulated enough capital, they themselves would become master craftsmen with their own shop and their own apprentices and journeymen. While there was certainly a social distance between the lowly apprentice and the master artisan, they were bound together in many ways. They not only worked together in the same shop, but typically apprentices lived in their master's houses, eating with him at the same table. All apprentices could also anticipate, with a fair degree of certainty, that one day they would themselves be the master. In that sense, neither apprentice nor journeyman were simply workers. They were master craftsmen in training. In the early 19th century, this system began to break down. The factory system, which replaced workers and machines, was part of this change. But there are other ways in which craft labor was replaced by mass production. By breaking down the production process into individual tasks, you could use semi-skilled and poorly paid workers rather than fully trained craftsmen. For instance, there was a growing demand for shoes from the South. Some masters responded by creating large shops with a division of labor, with some cutting the leather and others assembling the shoes. Typically, masters no longer actually worked alongside their journeymen. They became bosses. Journeymen were replaced with less skilled workers. These were often women and children who worked in their own homes, what is referred to as an outwork system. They were generally paid one-half to one-third the wages of a skilled journeyman. By 1840, women were about one-half of America's industrial workers, taking into account the widespread practice of outwork. Fewer and fewer journeymen could become masters, and there was a decline in apprenticeship. What emerged instead was a system in which growing numbers of Americans remained workers for their entire lives. In response to these economic changes, we see the development of local labor organizations. In the 1820s and 1830s, traditional craft workers began to organize as they saw their skills being replaced by machines, outworkers, and cheap immigrant labor. They were not necessarily opposed to the factory system, but they did try to assert a degree of control, demanding better wages, hours, and conditions of work. In making these demands, they often used political arguments, suggesting, for instance, that they couldn't be good citizens if they didn't have the time to become informed about the issues. This became a key component of their fight for the 10-hour day. Overall, the market revolution had created many opportunities to get rich. People with money to invest could put their wealth into commercial ventures, buy stock in canal or railroad companies, or invest in the growing manufacturing economy. Ordinary folks had more opportunities to find jobs or to enjoy the goods coming from the factories. Yet, the flip side of this was a society with clear, clearly defined class divisions. In 1800, only about 12% of the U.S. labor force worked for wages. By 1860, this had risen to 40%. Jefferson had envisioned a republic of independent farmers who owned their own land. What had begun to emerge in the North was something quite different.